Ang kutyo. Ang yun yung brahpaka nito kaya yung malaka na tip di sa malaka. Iki yung to ni ang yung brahpong pagdawa pitika yun to yung krom may tubig kapi kaday luing sri na may minoka tang sumu day daw yung po kaya yung di yung tubig chala sum chun. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and good afternoon to everyone in and around the courtroom, and especially to you, Dr. Chandler, along with Mr. Angodom, we represent Ms. Ng Sari. Uh, this morning, I noticed a question was posed to you concerning the bombings in 1973, and at which point you stopped, you looked at the trial chamber, and you asked whether you would be permitted to go into that period. The one could not help notice that you did not do that last week when you were asked questions by the prosecution concerning periods of 1960s, which was outside the scope of the indictment. And of course, when the civil parties were questioning you concerning events in 1940s and 50s. So my question to you, Dr. Chandler, and there's no need to write this stuff down, I'm sure you can figure out the answer. Why was it necessary to seek permission from the trial chamber for the defense and not for the prosecution of the civil parties? Thank you. Uh, my answer to that question is <coughs> the questions uh, dealing with material before 1975, to my recollection, I'm, I can say correctly if not, all dealt with the history of the Communist Party of Cambodia, about which I've written extensively, and I think which is a, that history is, a, is relevant to my own expertise. I'm not an expert on the American bombing, and also important to the proceedings at this trial for both the prosecution and the defense. When the question came up of the American bombing, as you could see from the answer that I eventually gave, I was not reluctant to talk about this. This is a horrible event in American and Cambodian history. But I did feel this is a question bringing something else into the, to the table, a foreign power that had not been discussed before. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that this was not a diversion. I was told it wasn't, so I gave the answer I did. OK. Uh, thank you. You could see, however, where it would be tempting for me to imagine that the purpose for you doing so is because you're here thinking perhaps uh, most likely to assist the prosecution as opposed to being here to give objective evidence. That would be one way of looking at it, would it not? I take a little offense at that. that. Frankly, I'm not that kind of a cynical person. Let's talk about your context and about the, um, the sources that you looked at. Uh, this morning, you asked a series of questions. I'm going to ask follow up on some of those questions because I don't think they went deep enough. Could you please tell us exactly who it was that you had contact with prior to coming here to give your evidence? And I'm not speaking merely for this trial, but also for the other trial, for 001. And I'm speaking about individuals working for either the Office of the Prosecution or for, uh, the Office of the Co-Investigative Judges. ແລະຈຳນວນກໍມາຕອນຊ່ວຍຕອບແມ່ນຈໍາດັບອົງຈໍາເລສສໍາໄດ້ຈໍາຕອບຂອບດໍານາງສາປີຍາອັນຕະ
I rose uh, before my learned friend finished his question. Um, we, we don't have a, a problem in principle with a question uh, as specific as whether or not Professor Chandler has uh, spoken to uh, members of the prosecution or OCIJ about his testimony. Um, but the questions need to be specific, and if that's the question, it can be asked. We have no objection to it being asked. Mr. President, I will go from the general to the specific. First, I want to know with whom he spoke with. Did you have a chance to speak with Mr. Header? Yes, if email counts as speaking, I did. Yes, it does count. Okay, fair enough. And um, how often have you contacted and exchanged emails with uh, Mr. Header? You mean in this year or what? From the moment he started working for this institution, because first he worked as the, for the prosecution in drafting the introductory submission, then switched over to the investigative sector to see whether what he drafted was correct. So um, I want to know, as of when did you have contact with him? And I believe this institution began somewhere around the neighborhood of 2005, 2006. Since his, uh, his work was of interest to me, but it was not, uh, did not feed into any of my ongoing research, I think my contacts with him were quite irregular, uh, mostly on a social basis, uh, just uh, trying to find out what kind of a event was happening here in, uh, in Phnom Penh. Uh, as I, my testimony, the time for my testimony approached, I did not specifically approach him and ask him, ask him in any sense how, what I should do or who, what I should say, but I did, as it came closer, I familiarized myself with more of the material that's readily available about the trial that I had not consulted in detail beforehand. Now, was that for 001 as well as for 002? That is Doik, who's the first one. Is there a particular problem with my English? I see you pausing. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I did much less preparation for case double one since that was largely about my book, which I reread in preparation for the trial. Uh, for this, this case, I had to we study not only the books that I've read that have been decided here, but lots of other secondary material to try and be as helpful as I could be. Dr. Chandler, stick with me. I'm speaking about your contacts with Heder. Did you have contacts with Heder concerning the Doig trial? Yes or no? If so, to what extent? Very limited, very limited contact, but yes. And with respect to this particular case, did you have any contact with Mr. Header while he was working for the Office of the Prosecution, that is, while he was drafting the introductory submission along with the other team members of the prosecution? Yes, I'm sure I did, but it wasn't to find out what was going on because I wasn't involved in the trial. It was just we exchanged documents about other parts of Cambodian history and stuff like that, but I wasn't seeking particular information from him at this time. Let me make it very clear, Dr. Chandler. I am not suggesting that you were seeking any sort of information from him. Right now, I'm merely trying to establish if you had any contact with him and if so, to what extent? And if documents were exchanged, that's something that does pique my interest. Could you please tell us what documents were brought to your attention by Dr. Hitler uh, during this period of time? He directed me to much of his 
lo uh, published material that I hadn't read, and that's mainly what he did. But yes, it, it was contact with him about at this time. And the published material that he directed you to, uh, was that related to, in part, uh, what he was doing for the, uh, for the Office of the Prosecution at the time? Not directly related, it, it had preceded this, uh, his role in the courts. He, he uh, led me to the uh, document cited this morning uh, from 1999, I think it was. It uh, led me to another th uh, thing he wrote at a somewhat later date, but not to specific court documents. That I've never seen a court documents before. Came here. So would it be fair to say from that particular answer uh, that he also provided you with uh, primary sources of information, documents that he had available, which had not been available or known to you? No, that's not true. He did not give me any primary source material that is not available to me beforehand. Uh, that was a question, not a statement. Well, okay, well, I mean, he did not, yes, I mean, I didn't, he did not provide me with such material. No, that's the answer to your question. All right. Now, after Dr., after Mr. Hedder went over and started working with the Office of the Co-Investigative Judges, did you continue to have contacts with uh, with him, and if so, uh, could you please tell us how those contact, what, what those contacts were all about? Well, it's difficult to tell you what the contacts were all about. There were frequent, frequent contacts between two colleagues who've been friends for 30 years, but let me say they were not about, uh, they were not, let me, let me put it another way. These contacts did not involve uh, any information that was not widely, widely open. I was not trying to publish anything. I was not doing my own research. I talked to him about the progress of the trial to an extent. This was interesting to me. All, he, he said off the record, so I'm not going to put it on the record now. I see. When he said he was off the record. Apologies. Uh, when you say off the record, uh, just let me make sure I understand. Am I, are we to conclude that there were some discussions, exchanges of emails concerning his work that you consider off the record and therefore uh, you're not uh, privy to discuss with us here today? Is that, is that how we are to understand that answer? He made it clear in some of these discussions that he didn't want me to write anything up. That's all. That's what I, I understood to mean off the record. And I never did write anything up from these discussions. Right. But what he didn't want you yes, to I, I, Don't you have to have that translated? I'm not sure. Okay, while well, he did not want you to write up anything about it, does that, can I conclude that he was writing or he was researching or he was drafting something for the Office of the Corps Investigative Judges, which is why he was having this sort of private communication with you, which you feel today you are not privy to discuss in the public? Yes. Our objection is in relevance, Your Honours. We had assumed that where counsel was going was to ask questions that might elicit responses relevant to Professor Chandler's studies and questions along those lines, we wouldn't object to. But counsel seems to now be turning to a impromptu inquiry into what information staff of the co-investigating judge's office 
considered on or off the record in their communication with other people. This is completely irrelevant. If Council wishes to ask Professor Chandler what information he was provided, uh, what information he considered informing his opinion, then that is appropriate. Going into other people's work and attempting to conduct an inquiry into other individuals who are not here testifying today is irrelevant and inappropriate. Uh, let me briefly respond, Mr. President. If, in fact, Petter was working for the Office of the Co-Investigative Judges, first and foremost, he had no business discussing that business, what he was doing, with anyone else. That should have been uh, within the Office of the Co-Investigative Judges. Unless perhaps uh, I'm mistaken how the system is supposed to work. That's first and foremost. Second of all, Heder is uh, a historian. As we've indicated, he worked for the prosecution. He then worked for the co-investigative judges. If, in fact, Heder now is talking to Chandler, and Chandler knows he's going to be testifying, as Heder would have known that he would be testifying, then we have a problem. And that's why I'm entitled to go into this, especially since, as of last week, we've heard testimony from Professor Chandler that he has, in some ways, shifted his position. Now, today he says what he received and what he has learned has been more for amplification purposes as opposed to revelation. But nonetheless, we're entitled to explore that because it goes to the gentleman's credibility. And that's why I think I should be permitted to have this discussion because it wasn't just uh, Heder, it was also Etcherson, and there was also Lacard. Uh, they were working for the office of the co-prosecutors. So, and we're not suggesting that Professor Chandler was doing anything inappropriate, but certainly if members of the prosecution or if members of the co-investigative judges are reaching out to potential witnesses and are having discussions concerning this case and are showing them documents, that it could lead us into a problem to thinking that perhaps those working in those institutions might be gaming the process.
บ้าอ่อนจังเลยกูเพื่อไปจุนตัวลูกจะกรมสองมัดดันไปฟังฮันตีสกฤตสมรัตตัวลูกสกฤตจุนตัวหนึ่งสมนัวจงกรอยระบบมิตรวีอันตรายชิดกาเปิดใดลูกยิงสี่จุนปูเนี่ยจุนเด่นสมใจลูกจะกรมสองมัดOui, merci, Monsieur le Président. La Chambre souhaite euh, attirer l'attention de Maître Carnaval sur le fait que ce qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui, ce sont les accusations qui sont portées contre les accusés dans le cadre du dossier 002 et plus précisément euh, d'examiner ce qui est pertinent à l'égard des faits qui sont l'objet du premier procès dans le cadre 002. Et toutes les questions qui concerneraient la, euh, la façon dont l'instruction a pu être menée dans le cadre du dossier 001 nous paraît dénuée de toute pertinence et donc cette ligne de questions ne sera pas autorisé par la Chambre parce qu'elle nous paraît dépourvue de toute pertinence. Donc, encore une fois, la Chambre souhaite que vous puissiez vous centrer sur les questions qui nous paraissent pertinentes pour apprécier les preuves dans le cadre du dossier 002. Merci, Judge Laverne. For the record, a witness's credibility is always pertinent, uh, at least in the Anglo-Saxon system. Now, uh, you indicated that you had looked at the closing order. Can you please tell us whether you read the entire closing order or just sections of the closing order? I read the text of the closing order, and I should make it clear, it was not clear for a little bit from one of your earlier questions. I had never seen any of this closing order before I came to Phnom Penh last week. I asked for it to be shown it. This was a legitimate request. I was shown it to give me background, get me to sp up to speed on where the things were. Now, I did not read all the footnotes. I've been asked that. I checked footnotes when there was something that looked to me like, where did this come from? Sometimes it, I couldn't think it. And uh, that's it. That's what I want to say. Uh, right, so let me make sure that I have your testimony uh, correct. It was when you came to Phnom Penh to testify was when the first time that you were provided with the closing order. Yes. Now, was that a hard copy or an electronic copy? Hard copy. And when you did look at the footnotes to go to the original sources that are cited in the footnotes, uh, it's my understanding you, you had a very limited, you had limited access to those, to those documents, correct? What's cited in the footnotes? I have no access to any of the documents. Uh, <coughs> I was familiar with some of them, but I did not have access to them in Trump Pan when I was reading the document. <coughs> and prior to coming to Phnom Penh, uh, I understand it that you were provided with some documents from the trial chamber uh, to review. You were informed that the parties would want you to look at certain documents. Is that correct? Yes. Aside from those documents, did you look at any other documents? And let me let me uh, specify original source documents. Uh, <coughs> the only I would have to say no to that. If you mean original source in Khmer, I've been not doing research in Khmer for this disappearance. Uh, all right. What if they were translated into English? I'm, I'm, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to do is exclude uh, academic journals, texts, and what have you. So other than the, the, the documents that were provided to you, which we, know, we have a list of, I would like to know whether you looked at other primary source documents, not necessarily in Khmer, that might have been translated. 
bọt bọt phải bị khai ở lục bàn mờ đi The things that look, uh, the things I looked at outside of those documents were printed sources uh, produced uh, by uh, the uh, study of the tribunal by, excuse me, the tribunal by John Chuck Carey that's been published, uh, the, <coughs> the seven candidates for prosecution that came out several years ago. I, read that. I had read that before, but so I went back to it. I read that years ago. Uh, some of these printed things, I just went around. I couldn't read them all. I had two weeks' notice, and I wanted to concentrate on the, on the documents sent to me by the court. And the seven candidates for prosecution, that's by header. Uh, he names the accused, among others. Correct. Yes, that's right. Uh, last week you indicated uh, on several occasions, and we'll, we will probably get into that tomorrow, that having read the closing order, it was, I don't want to say a constant, but it was, a, it was certainly a repeated refrain. Having read the closing order, you had reached certain conclusions or you wanted to adjust your thinking or your positions. Having heard what you just told us now, can we assume, since you are, you've told us you did not have access to the documents that were in support of the closing order, other than that was provided to you by uh, the trial chamber, that when you say, having read the closing order, you're talking about the text of the closing order. That's right. In other words, I'm not trying to, to pin you down and certainly not trying to uh, ascribe blame in any way, although I may appear that way. This is the process of uh, asking questions in court. It is, I understand, uncomfortable. Uh, you're relying on the text as opposed to doing a due diligence to actually look at the documents that are being cited and to see whether what is cited is indeed correct, accurate, complete, and in support of that, the assertions made in the closing order. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for smiling back there. That was welcome. Um, okay, uh, one, one thing to correct your wording slightly. I never said that I'd reached new conclusions or altered, adjusted my thinking. I never said that. I said no information came my way, which was interesting that I wished I'd been able to cite. And I said this morning, this would supplement some of the statements I made in other books. Cited the Sinuk letter, for example, about the conversation with Paul Pot. That was a revelation to me. I would love to fold that into my book. So please don't say that I said things that I didn't say such as which changed my thinking. Things I, I did not say that. Right. The closing order did not change my thinking. I, I, I'm doing a bit aggressive, I'm sorry. Um, second thing, um, there was no way, I think, that I could have conducted due diligence on documents when I was in my hotel room in Pompeii. So I didn't. I agree that I did not. I did not have the occasion to do so. I don't think that forbade me from finishing the document, finishing reading the document for, my inform for information purposes. Well, first, let me apologize if, I, if I mis, uh, misquoted you, although it wasn't a quote. I was trying to paraphrase, and if I got it wrong, I, I certainly appreciate you correcting me, and please do so on, on each and every occasion, and I will endeavor to, uh, to be as accurate as possible. Uh, and secondly, let me point out that uh, I'm not suggesting that you should have done a due diligence. I just merely wish to make sure I understand you that when you say based on the closing order we now know, you're referring to the text of the closing order as opposed to the text plus footnotes uh, having done an, a, uh, a due diligence on the footnotes to see whether uh, it is supportive actually of what is being asserted in the closing order. So I think we are in agreement. Is that correct? 
Yes, I think we are. After what you stated, it. yes, yes, we are. We are. Yung yul sarap ni chang. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to smile a little more to, uh, to make it go easier. Uh, if I could take you back a little bit uh, to that period that was referenced earlier this morning on the U.S. bombing, and not that I want to belabor the point, and it's not for purposes of justification, but merely for historical context, because I think you would agree with me, would you not, uh, Professor Chandler, that context uh, is pretty important when we're trying to understand historical events, albeit in a court of law. Would you agree with me on that? Certainly. So, for contextual purposes, uh, could you please tell us on or about what year did the bombing begin in Cambodia? You talked about 1973, but it happened several years earlier it started, that is. Correct? Yes, and I mentioned the earlier bombings in my statement this morning, began in 1967. Right. No, no, I, I'm merely trying to make a record. Yeah, no, fair enough. To go through some backdrop, <coughs> so you could be patient with me, and I appreciate uh, the frustration that you must be feeling. But uh, there must have been a reason why uh, this bombing was occurring. Can you please tell us why? The U.S. was bombing Cambodia. I really can't believe it's an American. You need an answer to that, but I will give it for the court. Uh, the Americans were bombing Cambodia as support of their war against the North Vietnamese and NLF forces fighting in southern Vietnam. Uh, that's the answer to that. This is a, that. It was not the bombing of Cambodia per se. It was an element of the war against Vietnam, which the Vietnamese, for example, did not refer to as the Vietnam War, but a total war against the Americans wherever it took place. Uh, thank you. We're trying to make a record. Just, just bear with me. And I apologize if some of my questions seem simple. Now, uh, before the bombing uh, occurred, or started, that is, can you please describe to us uh, the context a little bit? Sihanouk, as I understand it, was the head of state. And could you please tell us what was happening in Cambodia that would motivate the Americans to bomb Cambodia? Nothing was happening in the Cambodian government or, in the, or visible to the rest of the world that would uh, let the Americans bomb Cambodia. What they were bombing, or hoped they were bombing, and in many cases succeeded, was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which ran through Cambodia from uh, North Vietnam and Laos into southern Vietnam. And when you say the Ho Chi Minh Trail, are you speaking about Sihanouk having made arrangements with China to allow weapons to go through Cambodia to assist the North Vietnamese communists who were at the time you know, uh, fighting the South. Is that what you're talking about? For the sequence, I have to get back to my book. I have, I have written about this. Yes, this was certainly connected. Uh, I'm seeing a, the phrase frequently, and I think accurately used about uh, in this balancing act. Bit of this, bit of that, bit of this, bit of that. Play to the uh, Chinese, then play to the Americans. He renewed when the war was going badly in, uh, or, no, that's not the right way to put it. 1968, he feared that uh, having broken relations with the Americans in 64 may have been a mistake. So he, re he re resumed relations. And it seems from the evidence, uh, this is not entirely certain. But it seems that a quid pro quo for renewing uh, American uh, diplomatic relations was to continue the bombing along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's, that's I think, it's part of the public record. Sihanouk has said, as long, if you kill Cambodians, I'll go public. If you don't, I won't, because he didn't care what happened in the jungle or what happened to Vietnamese troops. 
Uh, so, yeah, in, in that sense, it was a reaction to Sihanouk. Uh, and uh, politically, I mean, did, as a historian, did you also study the politics in Cambodia at that period of time and what Sihanouk may have been doing to his political opponents? Yeah, there's a whole chapter in my book about that last phases of Sihanouk's uh, uh, time in office when he was very severe with his opponents. We heard that uh, bit of that in some of the previous discussion on Samlot, where it was put down very uh, uh, brutally. Uh, if he had uh, not been uh, harsh with his opponents, uh, Mr. Kusampan, Mr. Yung Suri would not have fled to the countryside, uh, and so on. I mean, yes, I've, I've written about this as well now. And if you could tell us a little bit, you told us that there was bombing. Uh, we know a little bit about what's happening in Phnom Penh, but outside in the countryside, how is that affecting, uh, or please describe to us, I should say, uh, what, what, it was, what it must have been like for the average Cambodian living outside in the rural area. Area. If there, if there is such a thing as an average Cambodian. Cambodian. That's a question I wish I could answer better than I will, but uh, <coughs> certainly in areas along the border, uh, it was pretty uh, difficult for these people who had Vietnamese soldiers stationed among them who behaved, as already I'm sure they behaved very, very well, actually, as it turns out, but that was difficult, uh, particularly after the Tet Offensive, which was of February 1968, which was launched from Cambodia. People know that. It was launched from bases here in Cambodia into South Vietnam. And as soon as uh, that failed, which it did except for public relations purposes, those, a lot of those forces were mown down. And uh, the, the North Vietnamese forces came into the border areas as opposed to the kind of NLF Southern Vietnamese people who had always been there for years, often since the 1950s. So it gets a lot harsher when the North Vietnamese get in there. The fighting gets worse. The war is going more, it's getting more questionable for CNO. Also, his own political base is getting uh, unsteady. The uh, assembly elected in 1966 was the only one that had been elected without his hand picking the candidates. So these candidates who were elected were not his, his people. Few were, but not all of them. So he's getting nervous, and this is, I've, I've doc documented this. Uh, and there's so many things going on at once. There's a growing resistance to his rule. There's growing discontent in the towns among uh, people. The economy is not going that well. Uh, in the countryside, there are people who are being pulled toward the war. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated but, but unpleasant situation, as you suggested. All right, and this continues on for some period, and then we know in 1970 uh, there is the coup, but the bombings continue all the way, as you indicated this morning. Uh, they were going on in 1973. Uh, do you know by that point? how it, uh, the bombings would have, uh, what impact it had on the countryside. We're talking about the physical uh, impact, that is, villages, farming, that's the livestock, if you could help us out on that. That's a question I answered rather poorly this morning, and I can't answer any better now because I know I wasn't out there, I don't have evidence. I said in a document that I think this uh, previous uh, council had cited must have been catastrophic, and I, I still stand by that. But I don't know how catastrophic, how worse in some places, better in others. But still, I should uh, not correct, but uh, amplify a little bit. In 1970, 71, and 72, the bombing continued to be along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. 73 was the shift to bombing populated areas, and that's the bombing that people usually talk about. That's the outright bombardment of the ring of fire around Phnom Penh that I mentioned this morning. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they, uh, I don't, I, I would say it must have been catastrophic, but I don't have first-hand evidence. I don't, I haven't talked to anyone who was in one of those villages and so on. So I, that's all I can say. Right. Now, aside, aside from the physical impact, as a historian having met with 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je formule donc une objection à la question qui vient d'être posée sur l'évaluation de l'impact psychologique et pour cela me réfère à votre jurisprudence d'hier, précisant que M. Chandler n'a pas les compétences pour donner un avis sur toutes les questions psychologiques. If, if I may, Mr. President, uh, we, we might get into that at some point, but I'm not asking for a psychoanalysis uh, if he has met with individuals and they describe to him what it was like living uh, in the impact it had on their lives. Uh, that's what I'm asking for. Uh, I'm not asking uh, whether it causes mental illnesses to any of those individuals. In that uh, limited context, context, if the gentleman uh, has an answer, that's what I'm seeking from him. Thank you, Mr. President. 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 Thank you, I can only repeat my previous answer. I said I had not spoken to these people, but the effects must have been catastrophic. In many places, I'm going to qualify further on, but I would say it must have been. I'll stick with that wording. Thank you. Now, on 20 July, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. On page uh, 98, and this is uh, a draft uh, transcript, you said the following. Let me read it. I'll go slowly. And uh, I can provide you with a hard copy, but it's, there's no dilemma here. Uh, you indicate, starting at line 12, on page 98 of the English version, Rural populations were told that American bombers were coming from Phnom Penh. So people, there's lots of evidence of this. The forces that entered Phnom Penh and some of the forces that entered from Battambang were extremely angry. They had been told to be angry. They had been told that this was the place that was not just a Western American but a place uh, that was out to destroy them, the cities. And so the cities were the place of new people who were also, just by definition, people who had not taken part in the revolution, which makes them, in Khmer Rouge's thinking, not us, but them, in other words, enemies. Now, my question to you, sir, is this. Uh, the people that were being bombed and their villages destroyed, and their cattle and their children maimed and killed, were they aware, based on your historical studies, were they aware that those bombs were American bombs? Uh, I can't directly answer that question because I wasn't, wasn't there, of course, but it seems to me they were told when Khmer Rouge forces could be in contact with these people, they told them the, the fact that these were American bombs. They didn't tell them that there were anything but that they weren't. And 
were they aware that uh, the government of Cambodia, both under Sihanouk and then under Lenore, was allowing the American government to bomb those areas? Were they aware of that? Based on your historical studies. ຈຳນວນບັດຂອງຄວາມຊິນໃນຊ្នាំປົມຫຼາຍເຊັດ You told us that the bombing started somewhere in 1967 and continued for approximately six years. You told us that it would have thought that folks uh, would have known uh, that uh, the bombing uh, was by the Americans. Do you know whether during this period the people of Cambodia outside of Phnom Penh would have known that the governments of Cambodia under Sihanouk and Lenore were in line with the United States. I mean, it's a matter of, of how they would have known or which ones would have known. People who were told this would have known. People who weren't informed probably wouldn't have guessed that the government was uh, in tied up with the Americans. This was certainly a, you can call it propaganda, but it was, which it was, but it was also a very valuable uh, tool of the Khmer Rouge to explain that, that the, the betrayal of the government, uh, what they saw as a betrayal of the government that allowed uh, such bombing to take place. I want once again to, to re-clarify and back off a bit on the, I don't want to leave the impression in the record uh, that the bombing of Cambodia, the, the blanket bombing of Cambodia in 1973 continued, unab had been unabated from 1967. I think a lot of people in Cambodia didn't know there was bombing going on from 67 to 70, really. It was been the far northeast, particularly the trail ran through some very heavily forested, unpopulated areas. If we're talking about 73, I think this is already after the Vietnamese have withdrawn their support the cease from the Khmer Rouge. The ceasefire with America has happened. The Khmer Rouge are starting to take command of the, their half of the civil war, which they had not had command of before. And one of their weapons, psychological weapons, was to tell as many people as they could reach that these bombs were American, that they were being directed at them. Uh, from, but this is a thing that was uh, the only untruth, was they were being directed from, the planes were flying out of Phnom Penh. In other words, they were their own city. In fact, those planes couldn't have taken off from Prabhu. People didn't know that. My, their own government is letting these planes fly out of Phnom Penh. Well, that's a minor detail, though, whether they were flying out of Phnom Penh or whether they were flying out of Guam. You would agree, would you not, that the bombs were landing in Cambodia on those villages, killing those people? If you could answer the question, um, the mic was not answered. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, say, didn't mean to seem fast, but it seems to be a very effective piece of uh, tactic to put this idea in people's heads which is very hard to absorb that their own government was helping to bomb them. Foreigners bothering Cambodia has been in their history for centuries. So that part of it was okay, another set of foreigners. But in cahoots with the people, your own people, this would have, I think, really increased the anger. I'm, I'm guessing again, but I'm sure it would have made people angrier than they would have been if it was just foreigners for no apparent reason, like a typhoon having an effect on the countryside.
of course, that was the truth, wasn't it? Wasn't the Cambodian, Cambodian government, government allowing the U.S. to ravage the Cambodian, Cambodian countryside through bombings? It wasn't that they were giving them misinformation. That was the truth, was it not? You as an American should know that. I guess it's not a leading question. You lead me back to something I've said already. I have said this already, that uh, what you're suggesting are not leading in, in any other direction. And I certainly don't want to detract from the... Uh, what I've, I've said must have been catastrophic suffering that was involved here, but uh, I'm answering the questions as best I can otherwise. All right. If we could move on to another area since the, uh, the notion of psychoanalysis came up, I want to look at passages from your book, Brother Number One. Uh, certain phrases, and perhaps you could help us out here. Uh, so if we could, uh, I'm referring to E3 slash 17, and the, um, if you have your, if the, if we could provide you with a copy of, of uh, this material unless you have the book itself, the revised edition. I'm referring to page 9, and for the, the, the error number is 00392923. The Khmer version is 00821673. And I don't believe that this has been translated into French. Our apologies. I will just pick out some of these phrases in this book. Here on this particular pa page you say, Sar must have been traumatized by the solemn discipline of the monastery. Now here you seem to be trying to psychoanalyze Pol Pot, are you not? I prefer the word uh, understand, but yes, it has psychological implications, certainly. Okay. And I'm going to read uh, a few others, so, and then let you give one more or less global answer at some point. On page 10, the following page, which in Khmer would be 00821674, and in English it's 00392924, you say, it is easy to imagine Solosar in the 1930s huddled at the edge of the stage watching the masked and powdered dancers trained by, uh, by his cousin and perhaps including his sister and his brother's wife performed by the light of hundreds of candles and the moon. You go on to say the, the following, in the next page, Khmer 00821675, this would be page 12 in English, or 00392926. It is impossible to say which impression of the palace prevails among Solasar's memoirs once he came to power. You then go on to say, he may have been thinking about the dancers or about the peasants he encountered later on. He may have been thinking of his own uprooted childhood in a potentially hostile city. The next passage, which would be on page 15 in English, uh, the Khmer is 00821678 or 00392929. More important, his affectionate family, orderly domestic life, and insulation from poverty may have helped to produce 
a deceptively smooth psychological surface and an equanimity that impressed observers for the rest of their career. Khmer uh, ERA number 0082168282 should be page 19 in English or 0039293. In the view of Solasar's later success as a teacher and his reputation for fairness, it is tempting to see Kvan Sivan at the first of several role models he chose to emulate. Next, Khmer 0082168888. There's a uh, I hate to break up my learned friend's rhythm, but I think by now we've all forgotten the first quote. I think you've got to break it up into manageable components. I, I, I think there might be a point that is coming, but, but I think that point can be made with two or three quotes. Uh, I think expecting the professor to, uh, as it were, be able to, to, to bring all of this together and, and respond to a question is, is just too much. The question will be too complex and difficult to answer, and it won't help the court. Mr. President, uh, the professor wrote these quite eloquent passages, and he is a historian. Uh, there was an objection about psychoanalysis. At some point, I wish to ask the gentleman uh, whether this is the way historians write, or is this some sort of a historical novel? Or is he taking literary license, and poetic license in, in, in writing, as opposed to providing uh, actual an actual historical account of Brother Number One? That's the thrust of, of uh, the purpose behind pointing out these very eloquent passages in, in Professor Chandler's book, Brother Number One. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just from the passages, uh, we, we may get some more of these vignettes, but just from the passages that we've just, uh, I've just read out, uh, first of all, you would agree with me that they can be found in your book, can they not? Oh, would you like to see them? I wanted my light to go on. No, I know they're in my book. Okay. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Okay. I just need to make sure that I, that we're all on the same page. Work with me, Dr. Chandler. I know, I know uh, it can be frustrating. Uh, but when you say it's tempting to imagine, and then you go on uh, to psychoanalyze, uh, is this for the? Is this because you're trying to make history sort of a popular read, uh, as opposed to writing history? Of course, I don't really like the implication. It's been said several times in the court that history is some sort of uh, unreadable pile of junk. Uh, 
This was a biography. The key point of this book, I think, the key point of the book is a biography. The purpose of the biography was not to write a chronological history or a chronological record of Pol Pot's life, a CV, if you like, which I could have done. It would have covered about two pages. But to try and understand not only the person from what we know about his life, but also the person we discovered from the effect he had on people who met him. I, of course, never interviewed him. Uh, for example, I knew people who had been to the same school with him in Kompong Cham, talked about this professor Kwan Si Pan, was a very inspiring figure, and, the, and that uh, Hunim was there, Kisim Pan was the same school. So I had evidence that this man had been very inspiring and forthright. Before that, Pol Pot had been in more or less French schools, had not been at a teacher that he ever mentioned. Uh, secondly, the um, business of his smooth outer appearance, that's the first thing anybody who ever met him said to me about him. They would rub their arm to show how smooth his skin was. This was a character who had a smooth outer exterior. Photographs reveal that. So I was trying to say that coming perhaps from such a comfortable, close family might have giving him a, if you like, a persona that could act this way. No, yes, they are uh, trying to make uh, it, it readable, but it's not the same. This is, was a biographical experiment. I didn't make those excursions in my, uh, in my other books that I know of. I didn't try to say what was in uh, Dirk's mind, for example, or Sihanouk sometimes, but not as much. I was trying to get, in, not inside, but get toward, toward an understanding of a person who was uh, and remains uh, very mysterious to me. And you have to do some guesswork to try and put light on the. And I think I'm just closing. I think in the preface I mentioned, I often have the feeling that he was in the room looking at me. I wasn't looking at him. I couldn't find him. He was behind me somewhere because he's, he's sort of in, unattainable in a way. Which is, yeah, go ahead. Well, I certainly. I uh, hope I have not given the impression that uh, history should be dull or a bunch of uh, junk. Uh, we do appreciate uh, your fine writing. Uh, but let me go on one more passage, and then I'll, I'll move on to my next topic. Uh, at some point, uh, you seem to be speculating as to what he might have read when you say uh, you talk about various books and by Stalin and what have you, and you say uh, it is likely that by 1952, Saar received most of his news and formed many of his opinion from journals produced by the French Communist Party. And then you go on, he would have, he would also have been familiar with Stalin's writing, especially his widely circulated history of Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And then you go on to say, it is tempting to picture Solosar working through these turgid materials by dim light, absorbing a view of the world that emphasized conspiracies, empowerment, vigilance, in the clandestinity. It would probably be misleading, however, to endow his activities at this stage with too much coherence or ambition. And I was just reading from Khmer 00821695, English page 32, or 00392946. My question, Dr. Chandler, is are you not here speculating that he would have read this material, setting aside your phrase that it is tempting to do this and tempting to picture him as this, setting that phrase aside, are you not? Uh, as a historian, taking liberties and making assumptions. You have to take some and, and some, and if they're, in, if they're illegitimate, uh, they're, it's, uh, it's right to object to them. My material on his reading comes from several interviews with former people who belonged to the French Communist Party at that time, French Communist Party histories, which I studied for my uh, work on Pol Pot. The atmosphere he was in, in the country with the most uh, Stalinist uh, 
regime even it was more Stalinist than the regimes even that had communist governments. This is a very dogmatic uh, communist party. And what you had to do every day was to read L'Humanité, their paper. All members read the paper. And if they didn't, they were, I don't know what punishment happened, but you had to do that. Stalin's history uh, of the Soviet Party, of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, CPSU uh, was also required reading at party meetings. They had to study this text. So I assumed that Pol Pot had done some of the things that other French communists were doing because he was a member of the party. Uh, now that might be a stretch, but I don't think so. As for the dim light, uh, we've located his apartment and in 1990, this was one of the most dimly lit places I've ever seen. Now he may have had a good light in 1950, but I doubt it. It's a funny little garret on top of a bar in the 15th small. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Chandler. Uh, speaking of assumptions, uh, uh, if I understand uh, your answer, uh, part of your craft, part of your trade is to at least, uh, after looking at certain material, to make reasoned assumptions. Do I have it right? Sorry, I spilled some water, but I heard your question. The answer is yes. Okay. And so, barring having what you call the proverbial uh, smoking gun, uh, there are times when you need to uh, make certain assumptions based on the available evidence that you have. Uh, but can I ask you, uh, at least in your experience or having viewed others, do you think that historians sometimes just get it wrong because they made assumptions or maybe assuming a bit too much based on the evidence available to them. Certainly, that's a great risk that historians face. Okay. Now, the next topic uh, I want to discuss a little bit is uh, some of your figures that you've come up with as far as the death toll uh, during this period. And the reason I want to do so is because having looked at a variety of, of uh, things that you have published in the past, uh, I don't want to say your position has shifted, but let's just say the numbers often uh, seem to be slightly different, if I can put it that way. And before we go into the actual numbers, can you please tell us uh, what is your estimation of the number of people that would have been that were killed prior to the fall of Phnom Penh, prior to April 1975? And let's just say we'll pick a window between the starting of the bombings, or slightly thereafter, all the way to 75. Do you have a a figure in mind? I've seen a figure of half a million, but that was not based on my research. There may be higher figures. That's, uh, that's a good question, however. All right. Now, when you say you saw a figure, uh, was this by a demographer or was this by a historian or journalist or a combination? Oh, this was by a demographer, certainly. I didn't, I, this is not a figure guessed at by a journalist that I cite. Okay. Now, when you say demographer, do you have one in mind? I, I, I hate to pin you down, but... I mean, <laughs> you're taking my pauses for reluctance. It's really because of the light. No. Uh, here you go. I have no reluctance to answer that question. The two... Uh, Books. One is uh, Le Genocide de Khmer Rouge. It's by a man with a Polish name. Uh, I forget. Slawinski, I think. And the other is by a man called Patrick Uvelin, who wrote a very good article on, uh, on and this figure that I think was ha appeared in one or both of those of those uh, published documents. That's why I, I, I cited it. All right. And in reading those ar uh, those articles, did you check by any chance the sources that they used in coming up with that figure? Uh, 
I looked at the, what they cited, but I had no way of verifying it. I, was, I, I respected these two scholars, that's how I have to put it that way. You respected them because of their reputation, or was it because of the journal in which they had published, or because you had heard of them, or a combination of all three? Just the level of detail in their arguments and their professional qualifications. <laughs> Do you know if a census had been done <coughs> prior to 75, and if so, when was the last census for Cambodia, and what <coughs> was the number? I'm certain the last full census was in 1962. Uh, the exact uh, figure, would I, it was in those sources I cited, but they're not in front of me, uh, what the population of Cambodia was at that time. This is often used as a base figure for uh, later population figures. I think it was 6 million, but don't, that, that doesn't make me the authority who said that. All right, and do you know what census figures uh, these two demographers would have picked for that period? 70 to 75 as a starting point, and then from there, you know, uh, deducting or, con or concluding that up to 500,000 would have perished. This occurred to me they were also being able to cite the work of another uh, uh, demographer called Migotsi, who wrote in French about this period. I haven't been in touch with that book for many years, but I know that was one of the things. He extrapolated some of these population figures in what struck me as a fairly professional fashion, so I uh, went along with that. All right. And have you read his work by any chance? The gentleman that you just cited, the French demographer. Yes, I did, long, long ago now, but yes, I did. And was that a book that you used in coming up with your own figures, or were you relying more or less on what others had been writing about as far as uh, the death toll? I don't have any, any demographic uh, talents, so I have to rely on these other people. Right. And that's why, uh, one of the reasons why I'm asking. Uh, now, we put together a chart, uh, and we'll make it available. Uh, we have it also in Khmer. Uh, I should note to the trial chamber that we just put this together. We have all the source material, although some of the source material is not on the case file, although it is by Dr. Chandler. Uh, and we're not trying to get the material on, but for illustrative purposes, we want to show the different positions that Dr. Chandler has, or the different numbers he's come up on different occasions. Uh, and because it involves several different documents. We have no objections, Your Honor, to allowing Dr. Chandler to have this, this chart and a copy of the material for him to look over. Uh, and then we can get to that area, get to that tomorrow morning first thing, if that may be convenient for Dr. Chandler. But I'm in your, your hands. Mr. President, I'm on my feet just to request that um, if such a document is to be given, Professor Chandler, it should be given to all of the parties and the chamber, and it should refer to the um, original documents from which these figures are sourced. In that case, we have no objection if, if those uh, conditions can be com complied with. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we certainly think that everybody should have uh, be provided with a copy, and uh, we apologize for not thinking of providing a hard copy to everyone. Uh, we can provide, uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. President, we could provide you with hard copies. I noticed that we forgot French. I think French will probably.
Uh, yes, um, although we do have a French uh, lawyer working with us, so we're, we're trying to cover that base as well. Uh, perhaps what we can do is we'll revisit this in the morning. Uh, we'll try to provide that, this information to you uh, at the, uh, before we leave today, or before you leave the premises today, so you'll have it we can go on the first thing in the morning if that would be more convenient. ហើយឯកសារនោះតើលោកបានបង្ហាញអំពីការដាក់ <coughs> ពន្ធពងជូនទៅលោកសាស្ត្រាចារ្យនិងអង្គជំរះនិងភាគីក្នុងបំណងដីដោលនៅថ្ងៃស្អែងនេះសូមលោកបង្ហាញពី <coughs> Right, first, let me let me make sure that uh, perhaps I was uh, inarticulately put my position forward. We have looked at various documents, some which are on the file, some which are not, that Dr. Chandler has generated. From that, we have, we have come up with a chart for to illustrate the point and to guide us through the documents that we are trying uh, that, that we are referring to is I can give you the error number of a document that's not in the file it's Dr. Uh, Professor Chandler's facing the Cambodian past it's error number in English it's 0082745 and 0082754. Then we have an excerpt from Tragedy of Cambodian History. And this is the 93 edition. And uh, this happened, I believe we do have a French your number on this one, but the English is 00193077, and French is 00824486. Um, and then again, in the same document, in the introduction, the 00193084. And then on page 236, which is 00193319, and then again, page 271, 00193354. So that's from David Chandler's book, Tragedy of Cambodian History, Politics, War, and Revolution, and this, as I indicated, was the 93, reprinted in 94. There is another document which is not on the file. It's called Epitaph for the Khmer Rouge. It's in the New Left Review. Published May to June 1994. We have it in all three languages. Khmer is 00820894. English 00813915. And French 00823369. Then there's voices from S21. This is already in. It's D108 slash 39 slash 2. And 
This is the 1999 uh, edition. And it's Khmer, Khmer 00191825, English 00192672, French 00357259. Then there's brother number one, and this is the 1992 version. And the pages are Khmer 00821668, English 00818412. Then there's brother number one again. Suppose the long term bomb from the Moy the Dive. This is the nineteen ninety-nine version. I have the, Khmer, the English uh, air number is 0039 There's an article at about from uh, at about in the Ethics in International Affairs Annual Journal, Carnegie Council in on, Ethic, on Ethics in International Affairs, article by Dr. Chandler, will there be a trial for the Khmer Rouge? This is not in evidence in, in the file, uh, but uh, it has been provided. To everyone should have it. And the uh, pages are Khmer. ជាប្រធានអង្គជំរះនឹងក្តាប់បន្តទេយើងបានសួរលោកថាតើឯកសារដែលលោកបំពងដាក់ជូនទៅអ្នកជំនាញនៃវិទ្យាសាស្ត្
Thank you, President. Mr. Carnivus, you've read out an extremely long list of documents. Before you can use them tomorrow, the Chamber must know whether those documents are on the case file uh, and whether they have been put before the Chamber. Uh, and, uh, because, as you are well aware, the Chamber's consistent ruling is that if they have not been put before the Chamber, then Rule 87.4 application must be filed in writing. Uh, so I, I think the Chamber wishes to interrupt this very long uh, rehearsal of documents so that we can get to the ones that can be used validly in putting questions to this uh, expert, uh, and I suspect that um, the President would want that information before you begin tomorrow morning, uh, and you can uh, uh, anticipate the Chamber's ruling if the documents have not been put before the Chamber, but you must, have ma must make a Rule 87.4 application, placing them on the daily trial the file is not sufficient. Thank you. Uh, uh, just one point of clarification, and what we will um, revise our, our little chart uh, to reflect all of that. Uh, Ron, uh, assuming, uh, assuming uh, that the document has not been placed in the file, can we nonetheless pose a question to Professor Chandler that elsewhere, for instance, you have noted that it's 0.13 million as opposed to 1.5 or one in eight or one in seven, can, uh, would we be allowed to do that if the purpose is to get the gentleman to testify to what he has written in the past? That's why I laid the foundation concerning uh, uh, these, these numbers in the demography, then I, I don't see the problem in simply asking him whether he has had different numbers on different occasions. You give him an opportunity to explain. But, but I'm at your Yes, thank you, President. Uh, as the Chamber has ruled previously, you may use documents that have not been put before the Chamber uh, uh, as a means of, uh, uh, as the basis for putting questions to the expert, but you may not identify the documents, or else we simply have to go through the whole process of authentication, uh, distribution, and all of those issues, giving adequate notice to the parties. So you may use them as the basis for putting questions, no more than that. I, I know it's subtle, but uh, this is the situation we are in with the uh, huge numbers of documents that the trial chamber uh, is, uh, is faced with, and of course the parties are faced with as well. Well, and it would be uh, preferable if you would give us your little chart today rather than uh, spend time on it before we begin questioning the witness, uh, the expert in the morning, before you re return to questioning the expert in the morning. Thank you. I know it's late and I, 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 I fully understand um, the chart, I'm, in light of your, your ruling, uh, I will need to revise it because now, in light of the ruling, I see that perhaps it needs a little bit of revision. But a, another point of clarification, uh, to be fair to the parties, to be fair to Dr. Chen, without putting something in, uh, would we be permitted to at least have a physical copy in the event that Dr. Chana wished to see whether, in fact, this is the figure that he put down. I, mean, I, I know this is sort of subtle, but <laughs> I'm trying. No. The short answer is you would still need to make an application to put that document before the chamber and uh, have uh, argument on it at a later stage. Thank you.
in the interests of uh, cooperation among all the parties. We've been looking through the various filings and um, council's application E172-24-3 refers to, as far as we can tell, at least two of the documents. That was an 87-4 application, so at least two of the documents have already been subject to an application. Um, that was E172-24-3, and then council also made a second application, E172-24-3. Slash five, which doesn't seem to um, relate to the documents being cited now. But I just wanted to share those for everyone's benefit. Bắt đầu đi đầu tiên là phòng làm mông đồng hai đây bàn tay đại gia miền Panya Hà lực lượng đời mình vì ăn rải chiết cà phê đây lúc yên thời điểm đi Panya Hà cái xã bẹp bòn đang cái xã mới chìm nôn đại luôn miền bắc miền bắc non đã số đánh đau trong buôn này trong điền nơi 
bất thay sai đời xa cả yudhya nông ca bằng hai nhà pi bình chi tại cửa xa nông kiệp bèo pon nông bảy hạt xây xây tiết đại bằng hai nông ca đại cửa xa nơi chỉ buộc một ông chìm ra đi được cho nên ông chìm ra thầm rạch thà bảy hạt đi xong ở lộ mười tuổi cái việc đây lục yên giới lý tiếp trong được mình chi ai cả xa đây là lúc mình bấm nón đã bị phía xa đánh đau chỉ buồn lại chậm niên như thế đòi chun một ông chậm ra làm gì vậy làm gì sao mà cá là nơi bậc ngày sai chạy bàn môn là về là đồng nai cả bị phía xa đánh đau và thông ở côn lục sát chá hay là những khinh tha về về lý chân hơi là hồ đó mong bốn đập làm được thì hơi hay Mình đã phải làm lao công, dạng chiều chơi như vua lục thập chá đại ban cắt khom bằng bảy, hay chơi lại nước sầm nua chỉ chơi ăn nông dạ pel cái lò mông này hay chỉ bị sai thay này, đại về về lý kinh tham yên ca yết đập ram nít ti, hay cái chấm đào cá sầm đào cá, sầm đập thay này, cái đào pel sầm lồng mồm sầm rạ hay ông em bắt cá, cái chấm đào cá sầm đào cá sầm đập thay này trầm này, sầm đào cá lực từ bên tàu thuyền được thay sai, thay ông kia ti mà phải buôn khay cả cái đài chăn nằm bị phong đập phí. Đói chấp đào bì 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 liêm mong bùn bùn bực Hơi xa mạng kàn ở thang ngày xa ấy nâng chấp bùn to ở thư vứ Đói ká tăng thông rút đánh đào chỉ bùn nẹ chùm đi đào bít chất lỡ Đói krom mì tà vi ká bì kà đầy lúc yên dưới Hơi xôn phía kì nâng xa thiên nạ chôn chí riêp Hơi lúc xa thà chá đào bít chất lỡ Ká xa đập ta khai kàm rô lúc nạ chùm nín Mần tôn chọc nở lời tí xa mạng kà Nâng bùn to thư một trai đoạn ba tờ la cá tầm lộc người ruộng chỉ mới nâng một trai ông cấp hiệp công việc xã thầy nâng lại chấm điểm trong ca để chun lại chấm điểm vào tờ lộc từ ti cái này để cột sân nợ nữ nâng ở trên cột tờ lộc một căn cái này vào tờ khay cam được nông vật tục xã mạc cam để vĩnh nơi bậc thay thay nơi bị liên mong bồn bồn và có ai nói rằng ti không khéng non luôn chun chập chao trong bài rúp tờ lộc tờ căn mà ti không khéng này ovo to to co bình cho hay nâng ở non luôn bộ cột tờ lộc một căn xã xã mạc cam để vĩnh nơi bậc thay thay ngày kia thì phải buôn khai cả đại chiến năm bị bòn bạc phí ở bàn môn mong của môn bực sầm rãi cho xong trên cao trường